Um, okay. All right. So thank you all so much for being part of the Engineering Career Open Forum today. I'm very excited to introduce you to Mark Chamberlain. He's a retired enterprise and global sales leader with experience selling complex, high dollar amount technology to Fortune 500 companies. These are, you know, your Disney, HPE, Microsoft, T-Mobile, Nestle, REI, Visa, and I could go on for quite a long time. As I mentioned before, he is an excellent advocate for youth and employment and career and advice. And so I'm just so excited that he's going to be connecting with all of you at Cal Poly Pomona. And so thank you, Mark, for being here. And if you wouldn't mind um, starting us off, if you wanted to say anything additional about yourself, go ahead. No, no, this is great. I I really enjoy working with you adults. And one of the ways it's happened is I have a bunch of friends with kids you know who are students your age and a lot of them really didn't want to talk with their parents about job searches so kind of got loud into doing this hey can you talk with my son can you can you talk with my daughter and then i also have two daughters who are young adults so i just found that i really enjoy doing this and i really want to be an advocate for young people so um if there's Maybe we do questions at the end. If there's questions that I can't answer, I'm happy to think about them. And then a lot of you can maybe email me some of those questions. And when I think about it, you know, I'll try to provide you with good answers. But just know that anything Alexis and I can do for you, you know, we're we're here to do it. So let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, as Alexis said, I'm a high tech guy. You know, I work for a lot of the big companies that you've probably heard of. Uh, companies like uh, Microsoft, I was actually with a team that originally developed Skype, uh, Cisco, Avaya, Polycom. So with Polycom, I did all this, you know, mobile video conferencing stuff. So I kind of, I kind of feel for everybody now that's just gotten pushed into video conferencing, especially if you're getting ready to graduate. And I just wanted to reassure you that there are a lot of companies that are hiring right now. You know, even though things are different, um, only certain aspects are different. And you'd be surprised how many organizations are, are used to doing video interviewing. So um, obviously one of the first things that you wanna do uh, now that you're getting ready to, to graduate is get comfortable with video interviewing. And I wanted to give you a couple of tips just to start. So the first tip is if you look at kind of how I am here, um, imagine an apple on the top of your head, and that's where you really want the top of the screen to be. Um, <clears throat> you want to be able to show your hands, because whenever you're doing a video interview, you want to show enthusiasm. You want to try to get those people to know you. Uh, as much as possible. And there's actually a number of advantages to doing video interviews rather than live. And I do mock interviews for, for college grads. I also do it for, a, for uh, a nonprofit. And I can't even tell you how often I sit down across from somebody that's getting ready to get a job and you know that they're nervous, you know, they're moving their hands around. Well, the good thing on video is you get to present what you want people to see. They can't really tell how nervous you are. And the other thing is you can have cheat sheets about the company that you're interviewing with all around you. So you can actually appear more knowledgeable than you may really be than if you're in a live interview. So a lot of it's just kind of, it's just getting with the program. It's just doing things differently and you know, there's this old saying, once you've done something five times, it's a lot better than the very first time you did it. So what I suggest you do is uh, do some mock interviews with your friends. You know, do it a number of times. Just kind of forget about your first couple and just kind of embrace the new way of interviewing. So um, a couple of things that I wanted to be able to start with is... Um, there are a lot of organizations that are doing interviews and the more that you can practice those interviews, the better. So Alexis, do you have like a, a mock interview program through the college? We do. So we don't have a full event day, although that's something that I'm actually thinking about. So for the students 
you know, here, if you are interested in that, maybe make a comment <laughs> in the chat, letting me know that that's something you're really interested in. Um, so we do mock interview appointments, however. And so Kelsey, our intern okay. team, our peer advisors, and myself, we can all do um, mock interviews with you. Actually, I have a mock interview later today with a student, and I had one yesterday. <laughs> and so it's a really common appointment type. So if you're interested in that, please absolutely do reach out to us. Well, I'm actually going to touch on that later in my presentation. But to me, anytime you're in an interview and you're doing it over video, the key is you want to keep it professional, but you want, you want them to get to know you as much as possible. So it's very important to smile. It's important to show that you have a sense of humor. You know, anything that you can do to, you know, help them get to know you is good. Now, one of the other tricks is to try to have the camera at eye level. And a lot of people use, you know, their iPhones or their cell phones to do video. And one of the tricks that you can do is put your computer or your laptop on a thick book or some magazines so that the camera is, in fact, looking, uh, looking into your eye. Because it's so much better if you're looking at me like this as opposed to you know, looking like this during your whole interview. So these are just you know, some tricks to the trade. And to me, all those things help. Now, the very most important thing that you can do when you start interviewing professionally for a job is to build out your LinkedIn profile. Now, I know that a lot of young adults are uh, really into other platforms, whether it be uh, Instagram or TikTok. And one of my daughters uh, is in more of the arts community. She's with an event planner and she says, oh, dad, you know, in our business, the only time people use LinkedIn is when they're looking for a job. And I said, well, yeah, that's the thing. If you're looking for a job, you want people to be able to find you. And the funny thing is whenever anybody reaches out to me, I mean, I don't Google them to find out who they are. I just go to LinkedIn and I pull up their profile and that immediately gives me uh, a better idea of not just their uh, professional um, background, but a little bit more about them. So, um, I mean, one of the things that I found out on an interview yesterday with a young adult was, uh, he was a football player on a football team, and it turns out that one of my best friend's son was the football coach for that team. So the way we started the interview just couldn't have been more positive. I said, hey, do you happen to know Mike Quigley? You know, he was a football coach. He goes, Mike Quigley. So before we even started the interview, we had personal touch, and these are some of the advantages that you have, you know, when you're using LinkedIn. So. Um, if I can chime in for a second there, I want to just echo what Mark has said. I think that his insight on the virtual interviewing was just so critical. Even for me, I'm like, is there, is it just an apple? I feel like it's two. Um, but really thinking about your background and all of that, I think it makes a huge difference. And I have heard and I've seen feedback from faculty even who, you know, are meeting with you in classes and have stated, I think that, you know, we, we all need to be a little more aware of how we're coming across on the screen that people can hear us if we go to the bathroom, just things like that. So really and truly be mindful when you're um, going into these interviews that you um, are talking to a real person who can really hear you, see you. Um, and so trying to put yourself in that best light, literally having a light, all of that. And then 100% LinkedIn right now is so, so critical. So thank you for saying that, Mark, because um, I would, I mean, I'm happy to connect with you as well on LinkedIn. It's in all of my messages. And that's another way to have access to the career team. But I think just additionally, you being able to be found by recruiters and other people, I think that's, um, yeah, that's a really yeah. key thing about LinkedIn. So one of the most common mistakes that I see when I'm talking with young people about putting together LinkedIn profiles and resumes is I think in many cases, a lot of students are too brutally honest and factual about what they have done. Um, often there's an emphasis on these are the classes I've taken, these are the specifics. Well, 
What I found, and I've actually interviewed many college grads um, to, that were interested in high tech companies that I work for, is as somebody that would be hiring you or interested in you, what I really want to know is, what do you like to work with? Because everybody interviewing smart, everybody has a degree, you know, there's certain, so what you don't want to do is you don't want to focus on what everybody has, but if instead you talk about what you're really like to work with on a team, and you can even ask some of your friends, hey, help give me some words so that I can kind of put that in, or have you worked on projects where you had to deliver on time and under pressure? So if you can be specific about that, when you, like, there's a headline for me on LinkedIn where you basically see everything that I want you to see about me, <laughs> you know, if you pull me up. And Alexis did a great job of kind of highlighting some of those things. But in a sense, that's what you want to do too. Um, you want people to see why you, as opposed to somebody else. And then the other thing that is just so critical is if you think about the hiring process, this is how it really works. Uh, let's say I'm gonna hire salespeople, engineers, business, uh, business people are for my company. How, how does that process actually work? Well, what I do is I fill out a requisition and I send that requisition into HR and then HR posts it and then the process is I have to say, what is the job category? What are the requirements that I'm looking for? And you know, what's the pay? What's the compensation? How long is this open? Where are they allowed to work from? Is this full-time job? Is this part-time job? Can they work from home? So the way it works is I send that into HR and then HR puts together a budget, and then they either approve or don't approve my request. So what you want to be able to do to be savvy, and I'm going to get into this more uh, and show you specifics, is um, the first thing is to put together a list of the 20 companies you think that you might want to work for and the approximate job categories that you think that they would be. And then you just Google those companies and you will find out all kinds of cool information. First, you'll find out whether or not that company is hiring. And frankly, through LinkedIn, I mean, every other day I'm getting messages on these are, these are the jobs that we think that you might be interested in. So once you get into the loop, you know, people will be reaching out to you. And what I would do is I would put together an Excel spreadsheet of, okay, these are the 20 people, I mean, these are the 20 companies I would most want to work for. And then through LinkedIn or Google, you can pull up and you can estimate, you know, who the hiring manager would be and who the HR person would be. And then the other thing that you want to do differently than most everybody is you never just send out one resume. And it's always a mistake to send out a resume or to go online and apply for a job and make it the responsibility of the company to figure out, are you a fit with them and what job would it be? So the way it really works is they send my, requis my requisition into an automated intelligence computer. And whenever you apply online, the HR department is looking for keywords in your application that fit what I'm looking for. And when I hear from people, gee, I sent out 100 resumes and they didn't hear from anybody. Well, that's because the 100 resumes that you sent out were all about you. And it wasn't about what you can do for the company and how you meet the job requirements of the companies that are there. So that's probably the biggest aha that I can give you. So I'm gonna show you some tricks on how to do that. But if you put together a targeted list of people that you want, then what you wanna do is you want to Google the job requirements 
so that you can put those job requirements into your resume and into your application so that when you click on send, all these keywords are gonna pop up that's on your resume or in your job application that fits what they're looking for. And once you do that, you're gonna see just a huge difference in your response rate. And one of the things that I do, again, I'm gonna show you later is, is I even use their sentences and their words because they're all professionally written. So you can copy paste that, put it into your LinkedIn, put it in, and before you know it, by just using some of those tricks, you know, you're gonna find that things are gonna go much faster for you. Because to me, um, like when I was applying for Cisco, I was leaving a big organization called Avaya. And when I left Cisco to go to Polycom, everything that I did was why they should hire me, why I fit their profile. I specified what I can do for them. And I basically implied, you know, why me instead of somebody else? So if you do those things, it's like you check on all the boxes. But if you just send in a generic, um, a generic resume that talks about all the classes you've taken, your GPA, um, that may just look like everybody else and it doesn't tick any of the boxes that they're actually looking for. So when I was applying for, say, Microsoft, I, I, I took the same basic resume, but I just tweaked it and I spent about 10 minutes tweaking it to make it very software driven, to make it services driven to make it cloud focused because now most of the big high tech companies want to take all their features and functions and put it into the cloud. But when I was applying for Cisco, Cisco was much more of a hardware oriented company and they were getting into unified communications. So I took a lot of the accomplishments that I did with Avaya that applied exactly to where Cisco is going and said, this is why you should hire me. And you know what? When, when I left Avaya and I called Cisco, I basically had a 30 second elevator pitch. And I got called back that day by that guy because of my pitch. And it was all because of thinking about exactly why they need to call me back it wasn't so much because of all these other things that I'd done. It was just a little bit of assertiveness and saying, hey, this is what they need to hear. So Alexis, is there anything that else that I should maybe elaborate on that? Because to me, that's really important. Yeah, I agree 100% when you're thinking about putting together your application materials. I know that sometimes, especially when I'm talking to my engineers and they say, it's a marketing piece. And they're like, if I wanted to major in marketing, I would have, right? But truly, it's your opportunity to think about your audience. So um, mm -hmm. I, I have this analogy, I got it from you know, one of our thought leaders in career, that if you walk into a store and you're trying to pick between you know, different cereals, you're not going to pick the one that maybe would say like, please buy me, I'm trying to increase my fourth yeah. quarter profits, right? You look at what, are you know those essential things that you're looking for right so if you're putting together a resume and you're trying to have someone notice you and why you're a fit translate that for them don't as just as mark said don't let guesswork be the thing that drives whether or not they're going to bring you in for an interview um i think we have a couple questions so i'll go ahead sure. and ask those and they're you know they're relevant to i think the job search so mm -hmm. the first one is from Joshua, chemical engineering senior. How does a student know on paper if he or she sounds too boastful about their experience or not being boastful enough? So as in, I think, confidence versus arrogance. Uh, yeah, so I would say be too boastful because um, the thing is, you should be proud of your accomplishments. You know, you've done key things. So I would absolutely be, be boastful about what you've done. If, you know, if you become friends with me on LinkedIn, you can say, you can say I talk about all the great things that I've done. <laughs> Maybe went overboard a little bit. So yeah, absolutely do that. And, you know, the, the thing is, people remember the story in you. They don't really remember their resume. And one of the most interesting questions that I was asked joining Cisco was, 
is there anything that you're in the top 1% on? And now, you know, at Cisco, everybody's smart. You know, they hire people from around the world. And what they're looking for is really the story so that people remember, oh, yeah, Mark is the guy that so-and-so, because nobody really remembers your, your, um, your resume. So some examples, uh, you know, there were people there that were like world-class bodybuilders. You know, certainly there's people, you know, who are athletes, but there's people that have gotten, you know, really far in robotics contests, or they've had a really interesting story that they could put into a two minute package about what they've done globally. Or they had a really unique story about how hard it was for them to get into college and what they had to give up to get through college. And those are often the stories that people remember. So yes, absolutely talk about your strengths. Thank you so much, Mark, I 100% agree. Um, we have another question from Winston Cam, Applied Mathematics. Excuse me, Applied Mathematics. Um, he said, "I recently applied to a few jobs on as a data analyst, and I'm having trouble finishing the SQL coding question online quick enough. What do you think I could do to improve it?" So I think it's really a question of when your technical skills you need to uh, up your level. Do you have any feedback on that? I'm I'm actually going to get into that because I'm going to do a profile on sales and systems engineering, which is really more the business side of engineering. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, what, so I'm a business guy from high tech. I'm not an engineer. And what I find for technical people is it's very important to be able to speak um, to people in normal lingo. So like on your resume, absolutely put down you know, SQL and the, the various certifications you have. But the key is to be able to explain it to non-technical people um, in such a way that they really get, you know, the value of what you've done. You know, there's this old joke, you know, let's say you're, you're telling your mom, you know, <laughs> about your accomplishments. Um, so, so what I would do is I would put I would put the technical words into your resume so that it pops up on the AI when they're looking at your resume. But anything that you're, that you're gonna put in a sentence or you know, something shorter than a paragraph, you wanna speak more non-technically so that a wider group will understand it because frankly, HR isn't gonna understand it. Um, and the thing that I found is like I've dealt with a lot of uh, CIOs, chief information officers and VPs of ITs and major corporations. They're more like me. <laughs> you know, they're business guys in a technical role and they hire detail people to understand the technical details. So it's very important that you be able to speak in both terms. So if I miss the key point, I'm sorry, but you know, Alexis, you can certainly um, send that to me and I'll do a better job. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that was, I think it's very helpful. So Winston, I think that there are so many great resources online right now that people are making available and completely free for you to level mm -hmm. up your technical skills, especially. So Cal Poly Pomona pays the fee for you to have license to LinkedIn learning. That's an option. edX is available. You have Coursera, you have, um, what are the other ones called? U Udacity. There are so many free courses that I'm sure if I were to do a quick search of SQL coding, there would be like a gajillion um, free courses that you could take so that you could continue to improve. And so I think just like Mark said earlier, it's about practice. It's about being able to apply these skills over and over again. Well, you know, there's another way. Um, and actually I showed Alexis a, uh, an example that if, if, if you have technical things that you've done, what I recommend each of you do is you put together your own website. So this was really an aha moment for me yesterday. My daughter, who's graduating with a master's degree this summer, had to put together a common information stores for lesson plans, for videos that she's done, for 
uh, her accomplishments. And what she did was she spent a day and she put together her own website and she was a history major. So she's not a, a technical person. And if she can put together a website in a day, you know, a lot of us can. I think, gosh, Jillian, I should have you put together a website for me. So this would be a perfect area for you to consolidate uh, technical information that people can pull up under technical uh, videos that you've done. And to me, when you're looking for a job, it's really important to stay relevant in front of an audience. And one of the things that I tend to do is I tend to post on LinkedIn once or twice a week. And what happens is every time I post, and I have about a thousand followers, um, all of my followers see that. And if somebody clicks like or makes a comment on it, then all of their followers see it. So, I mean, when I first, um, when I first retired, I did a retirement video and it turns out like 8,500 people saw that video and I don't even have 8,500 people. So there's a lot of ways that you can kind of build your strength doing that. So I would highly recommend having a website or putting together a blog, having a reason for people to, you know, basically reach out to you. So, um, um, not to the, the website that Mark showed me yesterday was so well done. And I think it was operated through Wix and I, I have some experience and I've heard from people that it's really intuitive and I feel like all of you could absolutely do it. I loved the idea of it. I remember in my grad program, they had us put together a website and I remember thinking like, this is just one extra thing, but it really is. If you're using it as a platform, I get a lot of questions, you know, from students saying I have a GitHub, I have a LinkedIn, I have these extra things that are on like my, my Google Drive, where am I going to showcase all of these things? And yeah. so a website could be a great way if you want to really work on your LinkedIn, they have a lot of opportunities for you to upload things too, but you don't get that clean look and you don't have quite as much control. So it's mm -hmm. an option, um, absolutely. And then a lot of these websites again are, are free actually, so. Oh yeah, yeah, because everything my daughter does is free because she's a student. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, so um, I want to share one of my most effective tricks. Um, once you have actually started the job interview process, uh, in many cases, once you're in the front door, you're going to have five or more interviews with that company. And it's very important that you try to connect on a personal level with every one of those people. And the trick that I use is after I interview with somebody, I record a 15 or 20 second thank you message for that person. And I send that video to the person that I just, uh, that I just interviewed with, um, either through email or through LinkedIn. And what that has done is that showed creativity, it showed I'm willing to go above and beyond. It showed I can actually say something in 20 seconds. Um, but the, that's one of the things that people remembered. So thank you notes are really important. Um, you know, reaching out to somebody and sending a handwritten note, uh, doing something different. Um, like when I do speaking engagements or when I meet with people, every so often I actually get a note and I remember all of them and I save them. And sometimes it kind of reinforces what I've done well. So um, anything you can do that's unique, and for me, being a video guy, sending a 20 second video uh, has been good. And I'll tell you, I know there's a lot of people that resist that, but when my daughters were like, it was down to the wire between them and somebody else to get hired, I said, Said, look, you have to do this. And they did it and it worked. So anyway, just another kind of short thing that I hope helps. That's a hundred percent true. I've been on hiring committees where we didn't give the job to someone who didn't send in a thank you note. Just for real. Right. That was the identifying factor. We said everyone else sent in a thank you note. They must not really want this position. They're out of the running. So, mm -hmm. so <clears throat> one of the things that I would recommend when you put together your list of 20 companies that you want to work for is don't think that your first job is going to be your ideal job. Um, when I graduated from college, I have two degrees, uh, one in business and one in communications. And I thought I wanted to be in marketing. 
so I was fortunate and I got a first job with a big global high tech company in marketing. And what I found was there was aspects to marketing that I like, but when I was using my personal skills, everybody said, Mark, you don't want to be in marketing. You should be in sales. You know, salespeople make twice as much money as the marketing people. Well, it turns out they're right. So after a year, I left marketing, I went in sales, and I never looked back. But the good was that the first job that I, that I got was with a well-known company. And my recommendation to you is to focus on how do you get the best job with the best company first? And the reason that's important is if a large organization is going to be hiring somebody out of college, um, they're going to be putting effort in a training. They're going to be sharing databases with you. You know, they want you to succeed and they're not going to be letting you go in two or three months. You know, large organizations can kind of go up and down, but they're, they really care about investing in young adults. Like when I was with Cisco, as soon as I turned 50 years old, I was basically given a go away package. We'll pay you X amount of money to go away so we can hire more killer smart young people. Well, I didn't go away quite then, but what I'm trying to do is show that a lot of, a lot of large organizations are so committed to bringing in best and brightest and young people that you should feel good about that. But what I found, because I went through the 2008 recession with Cisco, was, you know, life was hard, but I always had a job because I was with a big company. If you do a first job with a position that sounds like a really good position, but it isn't as strong uh, a company financially, you just have to be more aware that there's risks there. So my recommendation to you is look for the best company first. If people have heard of that company, even better. That way, when you do your next job, they go, oh, yeah, I've heard of that company. And it's like, it gives you some instant credibility just because they've heard of who that company is. Um, and the key is don't get paid with promises. Get paid with real money. You know, make sure you get a real full-time job as best you can. And a lot of these different companies pay differently. For ex And I'm going to kind of take you through some specifics soon. But typically, if you're in engineering, you're going to get 80% salary and 20% on bonus. And a lot of that bonus is going to be what your team accomplishes. If you're in sales, often your comp plan is based on 50% salary, and then often 50% commissions uh, or bonuses based on what a team does. And in a lot of high-tech companies, they have what are called RSUs, and those are called restricted stock units. Now, it used to be that companies gave out what were called stock options. Well, things ha happen. They don't really do that much anymore. It's called restricted stock units, which you can actually buy for a certain price. So you want to look for organizations that have things like that, because if they do, they're more likely to invest in you. And, you know, to me, that's just all part of what you're looking for right now. So if you're looking to get into the business side of high tech, um, you're basically going to be the vital link between the company and the services and the customers. And there's a lot of different jobs. Uh, like in sales, there's outside sales, there's inside sales where you stay at your house or you go into your company and you're, you're just calling on the existing customers, which is a totally different job from just going out and trying to bring in new customers. Now, to me, one of the most fun jobs is in sales engineering. And I'm going to, at the end of this call, I'm going to give you some examples of two friends of mine who graduated from college in 2008 and kind of what, what paths they went to. But, um, you know, there's so many different organizations that hire technical people on the business side. You've got wholesalers, uh, you've got manufacturers. My experience is that the manufacturers tend to pay the best. 
You have a lot of smaller organizations that are really system designers and integrators where they're taking some of what all these companies do and they try to uh, mix and match it. Right now, the highest growth area in high tech is absolutely security. And the reason security is growing so fast is all these companies have taken their features, their databases, they put it in the cloud, and the cloud isn't as secure. So they're hiring a lot of security people. So they're not just hiring engineers, they're hiring people you know, in accounting because they're growing fast. They're hiring salespeople. They're hiring people that can cross function. So, I mean, there's actually, there's a lot of activity going on right now. And from what I've seen, most of these jobs pay between 60 and $90,000 a year, you know, for people that are right out of college. The average systems engineer or sales engineer that's kind of, by the time they're 30 years old, you know, they're up to $100,000 a year. Uh, top SEs or system designers are often making 160,000 a year, plus, you know, all the stock that we've talking about. And what I found is that if you're in sales, you're in a higher risk area because it's very performance based. But if you're on the technical side, Companies want to keep your skill sets. And what's important, if you're technical, is that you be able to speak to what your own company does technically um, at various levels. You know, the, the very low level in terms of, you know, technical details, the higher level, which is how your technology helps meet the business drivers of the organization that they're looking for, you know, the strategic level, uh, so that if you're dealing with a VP of IT or a uh, CIO, you're gonna be dealing with a salesperson who understands all the basics of the technology, understands how to answer all the common questions, but he may not know what that really means that he's saying. He just knows how to answer it. If somebody comes back and asks him, well, you know, a couple later, that's what salespeople don't know how to do. And that's what technical people on the business side do know how to do. So if you're interested in kind of being the technical encyclopedia, having a job for a longer period of time, if you feel like you get along well, uh, with customers and you have a curiosity for what all your competitors are doing. And the funny thing is like in business, people don't buy the best solution. You can absolutely be technically the best, but if you're too expensive or you don't fit with the environment that they have, or you don't get along with somebody, um, or um, there's changes in their management, the funniest thing is a lot of technical people don't get that people don't buy the best technical solution. And it's almost like if you go into a computer store, look at how much stuff is available. People buy all kinds of stuff. You know, people buy all kinds of cars. You know, they buy what they can afford or they don't buy a car at all. So you can go through the whole process, do everything right, and it doesn't mean that it's going to happen. So being savvy on some of those things, uh, you know, really does become more and more important. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I hear a lot uh, as I speak with engineering students about sort of the dream projects that we all have, and that's you know that's a wonderful thing. But having a pulse on what the market also wants is a really critical piece as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that probably one of your engineering classes goes into that design of also checking in with like what do the customers want, and then what's feasible based on based on the that feedback, and then designing a prototype and getting their feedback again. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a really critical piece. So Mark, we actually have quite a few questions. Do you mind if we go through a few of them? Um, or do you wanna wait? Sure, we can questions? go through some, and then I just have a couple of other things that I wanna uh, cover, but I'm extremely flexible. Thank you so much. So we have- I appreciate you asking all these questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel it's, it's a really active chat. It's very exciting. So we have a couple about basically having little experience. So Sahar had shared, what if a student's a fresh graduate, um, where the skills they got were only done in class and not in real life. How can we relate to the job, convince them we're a good fit? Um, Michael shared, you know, what if we don't 
understand yet what our strengths are that set us apart. Um, so there's the little experience side, and then Johan's also shared on the if you have maybe too much. So is there a point where a student would be overqualified for an internship? Like let's say if they were in management before. So these are all I think questions around like too qualified, not qualified enough. How do you know how to communicate your story? So I would say um, in today's environment, if you're truly overqualified, they're gonna see that and they won't even respond to you. The key is to look for things that you are qualified for. Um, I mean, I've been in situations where I've been overqualified for some things, but I've actually taken a step down because it paid better. So these are things that corporations know too. Um, let me give you an example of like what the Aerospace Corporation in El Segundo, California, they have a job right now and it pays between 87 and 110,000 a year. And when you look at the job requirement qualifications for this job, it says, we're looking for somebody with a BS in computer science, computer engineering, electrical engineering. And then it says zero to one year of professional experience. So, hey, you fit their criteria. And then below that, proficiency in multiple software languages, basic knowledge of networking concepts, networking analysis uh, methods and tools, excellent verbal and written English language skills, effective communications, and you need to have the ability to present to a group. Uh, you need to be able to obtain security clearance, and this is a full-time job. Um, so what I would do to kind of answer those questions is I go online and I pull up some of these requirements, and these are the requirements that I type into um, my LinkedIn profile, and I use the words that they have because, as I said, they're professionally written. But, you know, right now, I mean, I really think that it's okay to be overqualified for something. The key is to highlight where you think your fit is, why you want to work for them, and what you think you can really do for them, because that's honestly more important than just pure qualifications. Because that's where you're really selling yourself as an individual in your passion. Because um, if, you re if, if there's something about what this company does that you see and you have a passion for that, that's what's gonna stand out. So that's what I think you wanna talk about more than being over or under qualified. It's just showing that you fit the requirements. Does that help, Alexis? It does, thank you so much for that insight. And additional thing I would add is, I think sometimes we get really caught up on the job titles, like we almost wanna use the one that HR used, but those tend to not be used in real life. So something that I did was I went back to my supervisor and I said, um, I'm applying for these kinds of positions. It was an internship anyway, they were fine with it. So I was able to say, I'm applying for these kinds of positions. I don't necessarily think that the job title that I had is, um, is coming up as relevant to this position. What do you think of this title? And they were like, yeah, that's absolutely fine. And so I included that and I had in parenthesis, you know, what was it called? Front assistant one or something, which is meaningless, right? So, um, so I did something that was a little more representative, which was, you know, operations, office management kind of thing. And so that helped so much. So if you want to talk about those specific details of yours, the job descriptions you're looking at, um, and how you can tailor your story, that's 100% what the career specialists are here for and our wonderful graduate interns like Kelsey. So please do reach out to us and we're happy to go into more of that specificity with you. So kind of following along with that, one of the things that I pulled up yesterday to prep for this call was I Googled the 20 best new grad network engineering jobs that are hiring now through an organization called Simply Hired. So that's kind of where I read this from. Well, let me give you all the different job titles for a college grad, you know, that has engineering. So first, there's um, network engineer level one, network engineer level two, network security engineer, 
I like this one, a virtualization engineer, uh, telecommunications engineer one, um, network engineer junior, network development engineer, um, network, and that was from Amazon. Actually, Amazon is hiring up the gazoo right now. I have a lot of friends that have gone to Amazon, and most of them really like it. A network administrator, field service engineer, and kind of the list goes on. And in every one of these cases, it shows the general pay category and then the drop down box that I kind of read to you about what the requirements are. So, you know, you're right. One of the things I was going to do was I pulled up Cisco, and Cisco has a training program for college grads. It's kind of like their own in house master's program where you learn all about Cisco products. And you click on Cisco for new grads, and there's all these different boxes, you know, where you want to work, what country. And then, as you had mentioned, there's job categories, and there's so many different job categories, you know, including interns. So some of it is a process. And, you know, what happens is you go through the process and you become more savvy. And the, the thing is to just get into the game. Yeah, that's really true. Um, another question from Joshua, it was actually the first one in the chat, but um, his is really relevant to COVID-19, so he had an internship offer, and it's currently being postponed, um, and they're not 100% sure that it's going to restart. And so his question is, you know, this is a company he really very much wants to intern with, is really excited about it, but in light of COVID-19 and it being postponed, should he apply to other internships? Is that appropriate or ought he to? Well, yeah, it, it is appropriate, but here's the thing. It depends on if it's a paid internship or not a paid internship. If it's a paid internship, then absolutely apply to others. If it's an internship where you're just spending a certain amount of time and they're not paying you, then they probably will do everything they can to keep you. And then it, it also depends on how big an organization it is but what I would do is, you know, put 20 minutes into, again, why you want to work there, what you can do for them. Um, because as long as you're showing reasonable assertiveness and passion for what they do, um, when they receive good news emails, people read those. You know, they may not want to get asked a lot of questions, like don't send an email, hey, do you still want me for this? Send an email that says, hey, I just want to reassure you my interest in this program, you know, that I can start such and such. I get that it's a complicated environment, but I can do this, this, and this for you. So that's how I would approach it. Yeah, 100%. So staying top of mind, this is a really big company, I think. I won't necessarily say unless you want me to, Joshua, but um, I think that they, I'm sure that they want to continue their internship program if possible, but I don't think that it hurts you to go ahead and apply to other opportunities in the meantime and just again you it, and then it's more of a decision if you get another offer about what to do um so i know that you want to continue mark do we have time for at least like a couple more this is specific to well let me yeah, let me just share two success stories with you and then i can either answer some additional chats or alexis if you find that there's a lot of commonality if you want to send me an email i'm happy to respond well, the main thing I wanted to do is offer encouragement to all of you. And when I started Cisco in 2008, it was a downturn in the economy. Uh, you know, that was back when the home mortgage fiasco took place. There's a lot of movies about that. Well, I have two friends who graduated from college then on the technical side, and they kind of took different paths, but both of them did really well. So one of them, um, graduated from a different college in Pomona, and he had a bachelor's degree in computer science. And his first job was with Cisco as a systems engineer. And then he rose up and he became an engineering manager, and he went around and he kind of became an engineering manager for a lot of the different Cisco practices, which are things like data center, unified communications, networking, and that's how he had broader experience. And then he got a promotion to go to a smaller organization 
called Glue Networks, which is pretty technical. And he became the vice president of sales and business development as an engineer. And I can assure you that job paid better <laughs> than where he was coming from. And then where he is now, and let's just say he's 32 years old right now. Um, he is with Proofpoint, which is a big software company, and he's the vice president of sales engineering, which is a really good job. And a lot of my friends, you know, from Cisco especially, uh, work there. Now, another friend who graduated with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, his first job was actually in sales. And he didn't like sales. So what he did was he was in that job for a year, and then he went to a company called Stuffbox, and he was a technical product manager uh, in the marketing department. And then after doing that for a couple of years, I think a lot of you have probably heard of the company Box. Well, he went to Box as a product manager, and he had big responsibility as a pretty young person. And a year ago, or two years ago, he left Box and he opened up his own company and he's now CEO of a software company called WorkRamp. And he's doing really, really well. And he started, you know, in one of the biggest downturns of the economy. So, you know, just, you know, have confidence, have thick skin, know that uh, Kelsey, Alexis and I, we're here to help you. And it's very important to keep a positive can-do attitude through all of this. Yes, 100%. And that's my pitch. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Um, so a question for you about remote work. I think increasingly we're adjusting to going remote. So for you, um, how did you find yourself working remotely? Was it affected to maybe your hobbies, your lifestyle, residence options, free time? Um, you know, what no, kind I'm of I'm happy to address this. So um, I did not like working remotely for the first year. What happened was I was with this big global company called Polycom. And uh, in almost all my jobs, I've had really nice offices by Orange County Airport. Well, what Polycom did, they were in one of those cool buildings. They were spending way too much money. They had to cut costs. So they sent everybody to a home office environment. And frankly, I mean, other than painting the walls that used to be pink, because this was my daughter's bedroom and making it look more professional, um, the biggest effect was really on my wife because I'm around all the time. And in between calls, you know, I'd get out, I'd walk around. And instead of walking around uh, a campus, I'd be walking around here. I kind of missed some of the perks of being in a nice office building. But quickly, I didn't miss the commute. I worked really long hours. And if I was going to work from, say, you know, 7 until 6, work 11-hour days, then with the commute on top of that, I mean, we're talking really long days, especially when you're doing global stuff. So, frankly, I got on board with working at home much faster. And then... The jobs that I had after, uh, after that has all been work at home. And frankly, now I really prefer work at home. And I ping people all the time. I tend to over-communicate, and that helps. And then I also use video a lot so that people know who they're talking to. Yeah, that's really helpful. So I think we're all becoming sort of experts in being effective and productive in a remote environment. So I think... Um, as we're thinking about potentially going into sales engineering or some of these remote jobs in high tech. It's something you can consider a lot more. Um, so thank you so much for that question, Alexander. Another one um, is from Rizwan. I'm so sorry if that's not the correct pronunciation. Industrial engineering asks, how did you approach new potential clients in sales? Oh, okay. So um, I'm going to kind of give you a spectrum. When I first got into sales, I sold business telephone systems to businesses in Orange County. And I physically cold called office buildings, looking for companies that are moving, or expanding, networking with real estate people. You know, it was all finding new business. 
And then as I got with bigger organizations, uh, companies like Cisco and others, I had like 10 accounts. And I, I dealt with companies like Disney and Ingram Micro and a bunch of companies that you've heard of. Now in that situation, what I had to do is find more people within those organizations to sell to. So like with Disney, I was responsible for selling uh, the reservation computer systems and things like that. So I had to reach out to Disney Cruise Lines and Disney in International and go to Orlando. So a lot of that was finding out through existing people who they think I should call on. That is an easier job than just finding new business. Finding new business is a lot of pulling up databases, who are the companies in your target market, knowing that there's turnover in jobs every couple of years. So most of the databases that you have are already legacy. And that's why you wanna be on LinkedIn so that you can connect with people through LinkedIn, you know, and try to find people through LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest tool today to find who the right person in the company is. Thank you so much, Mark. All right, so it's one o'clock. I know that most of you have to get to class. Mark, thank you so, so much for your insight and to all of the students. Thank you so much for your excellent questions. I had a lot of fun reading through them and trying to sort them into categories and, and they were excellent. So just thank you all so much. I've well, left- Kevin, Good luck, everybody. And I, I've left a link to a form in the chat um, for a couple of you who still had additional questions. I'll stay on for a few more minutes. So if you wanted to talk to me, I'll be here. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Okay, bye-bye, folks. All right. thank, thank you, Mark. And I don't know if you can, um, maybe Mark had to leave. Maybe. Fine. Okay, so for Daniela, I don't know if she's still on the call. I know you had a specific question. Um, and I'm happy to answer it now, but I'm not 100% sure if you're still here. Um, I think she probably, oh, she's still here. I see her name still in the chat. Yeah. Um, it's a great question, Danielle. I'm happy yep. to. Sorry, Alexis. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Oh, perfect. That was inside, so <laughs> I wanted to make sure I'm a little outside. Uh